Right, so now we're very pleased that Christian Walmer, who's just given a fantastic talk to the Warwick Politics Society, is joining us for a quick interview now. Uh, Christian is, of course, a railway historian. He's also an author, journalist, and has also been a Labour politician, stood in the uh, recent London mayor election and, of course, in the Richmond by-election. And he's also a Warwick alumnus. We'll start off with that last point. Uh, got any good memories from your time at Warwick? Well, uh, uh, a couple of My first day... Uh, after the, the fresher stuff, and, and I was coming into uh, the first lecture uh, from uh, Leamington Spa, uh, where I was staying in Beecham Lodge, actually, I don't know if that's still there, Beecham Avenue, and uh, somebody drove us in, and he was charging us a shilling, he, he, he had a car, and there's three or four of us, and we each paid him a shilling to kind of uh, go in, which five people, and uh, uh, and at the time, uh, we, we came from, from uh, uh, Leamington on the, on the side road, not on the main road, and you had to cross the Kenilworth Road to, to get across it, and there was no roundabout there at mm. one point. And we dropped somebody off at uh, the top, which was the Maths Institute, and because I thought this guy was a bit of an idiot, I didn't then get in the front seat next to him, but stayed in the back seat like I was a taxi. And he pulled out in the rain, right in front of another car, which smashed into the passenger car door. And if I'd been sitting in the front, I would not have been, uh, been on the earth for the last 50 years. I would have been dead. Oh and because uh, it hit it with some force, it got me in the back a bit, and it gave me a bit of a, 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 a backache. But I was kind of all right. And so it's I your first day, did you it say? It's my first <laughs> day. And, the rather, and so I rather went into the first economic lecture I went to, kind of hobbling a bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, rather, no, no, suffering rather from post traumatic stress. <laughs> oh um, and it was, uh, uh, you know, it really was, was very lucky that I wasn't killed in that. Um, and I still paid him his shilling, I think. <laughs> I think he might have some compensation now. <laughs> and the other thing, is, I, I, the other story that I had was that I, I uh, spent you know, two terms editing Campus newspaper, which is the predecessor of the board, uh, and really cut my journalistic teeth on it, but, and, and dropped out by the end of it, uh, uh, but came back later on. Uh, but the worst incident that happened there was that there was this guy called Steve Maslin who was helping us stick up the newspaper. Actually, he was just there, slightly drunk in the corner. <laughs> it was three or four o'clock in the morning. Uh, and we used to put everything together on big sheets of paper with letter set, which is a way of kind of putting your letters out uh, from big sheets. Uh, and then typing this, uh, the copy onto uh, little slips of paper and then sticking it in with cow gum. So there's lots of cow gum. And he was kind of playing with cow gum in his hand, with a great big ball of cow gum. And then he was stupid enough to light a cigarette. And his hands kind of just immediately started actually burning. And, and luckily there was a sink for some reason in the campus room, which was the top of, of uh, Roots Hall, right, if that's still there. Um, and, uh, and I managed to, to, to start throwing some water at him. He noticed and he kind of got the water, got his hands underneath the tap, but by which time he'd had second degree burn so we took him to hospital and, and eventually he was about a week in hospital but he was kind of all right at the end but it's certainly the most one of the most terrifying incidents in my life i mean this guy's hands were just burning in this you know ridiculous thing so i don't think he ever played with calgary Oh, Did he quit the paper after that? <laughs> well, it wasn't really. It was just sitting there. It was, it was the boyfriend of somebody who wasn't. It was just kind of messing around, really, as one did. You know, it was three o'clock in the morning. Brilliant. Okay. Um, one of the things that you came in to talk about was transport policy, and that's your speciality as a historian. What um, do you think would be your main points for transport policy if you could sort of formulate your own transport policy for the country as a whole, maybe? Well, I think you, you have to separate kind of inner cities with, with uh, regional transport. But there is no doubt that inside cities, uh, the rationale has to be to limit car use. Uh, and, and you have to phase it out, and you have to work towards phasing out. And all the best cities in the world have done that. You know, they, they I mean, even New York, you know, where they, they, they've pedestrianised Times Square. Um, uh, you know, because the idea that all cars can go into the centre of the city and it's a kind of rational distribution of, of resources or a rational kind of form of transport is ridiculous. Uh, you know, there, there should have been restrictions far, far earlier. So you have to somehow do that. And the difficulty is getting that across politically uh, because, you know, we've had... Uh, I can Livingston manage to get through his congestion zone without uh, uh, putting it to the, to the voters until afterwards and he did get re-elected. But both in Edinburgh and Manchester we've tried that. Uh, and they've lost both times. So, uh, so you have to do that. 
and you have to have a policy that orientates people more and more towards walking, towards cycling, towards using buses. Trams are a catalyst for that. And, and John Prescott, when he was Deputy Prime Minister in 2000, promised 25 tram schemes over the next decade. Um, and got stopped basically by lack of money and by what he called the teeny boppers in number 10 down in the street. And, and that was a great shame because that was moving in the right direction. And wherever trams have been uh, put in, they have improved the environment of the city. I mean, Manchester is a clear example. You know, Lots more places should be like Manchester. Birmingham has just extended its tram uh, through to the town centre. It's made a huge difference. Uh, nobody used to use that tram because nobody knew it just went off to, to Wolverhampton or Walsall or whatever. Uh, and now actually people are beginning to use it because it goes into the town centre. And, and so transport plans for years and years have known the key policies. Uh, um, and, and yet the politicians haven't managed to, to introduce them. And I think air quality is the big game changer here. That, that, that will really facilitate uh, the adoption of, of, uh, of reasonably radical policy. It'll be very interesting to see what happens to the mayor, the new mayors of Birmingham and, and Manchester and, and the like, whether they're able to, to have uh, uh, policies that, that uh, bring about that, that shift, which is never been gradual. In terms of inter-regional policy, uh, you know, obviously the emphasis has got to be on, on, on uh, improving uh, trains, in reducing the, the, the need to travel, uh, in better planning policies that mean that more things are, are near uh, railways and near uh, bus stations and the like rather than kind of being in the middle of nowhere and stuff. But it is difficult. I do recognise that we're not going to phase out cars kind of uh, immediately from, from suburban and, and uh, 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 rural areas, but you have to move towards that. I mean, there is an imperative of climate change and air quality and and, uh, and short livability. You know, the, the London in London, the, the cycling superhighways uh, have not just improved a lot of cyclists, but they've improved the whole environment in central London, the long embankment, you know, which is now a pleasant place to walk, which didn't used to be. So, so there's all those issues. On the issue of transport widely in the UK, when you gave a lecture at my school, actually Richard Challenger, a couple of years ago. You, one of the things you asked us was, could you name the Transport Secretary? Um, and I suspect most people can't name the Transport Secretary. It's something that it's not seen as a key department. Um, do you think we'll ever be in a situation where transport is actually taken seriously to the level that you'd like to see it? I think it's gone up the agenda. I, I, I think that uh, there is a, a recognition, for example, from all, all uh, three main parties, uh, that uh, railways are uh, a positive force and that we should spend money on railways, which was not the case 15 or 20 years ago. So it has gone up the agenda uh, to, to some extent, but I, I don't see it becoming you know, a top rank job because there is the failure to recognise its importance. You know, everybody travels every day virtually. You know, we all use a, a form of transport you know, most days of our life and, and yet uh, it, it's kind of considered as a kind of subsidiary issue, which is a great challenge. And so until it gets up the agenda, uh, I don't think it's important, it's going to be sufficiently recognised. But I'm, I am positive that it has gone up the agenda a bit, mm. but just not enough. Okay. Um, you've been involved in some quite high profile elections in recent years. Can you tell us a little bit about your experiences in those? Well, I suppose the, the most exciting thing was to have been uh, shortlisted for the Walmart for London uh, campaign uh, to, to be mayor uh, and alongside kind of some very prominent politicians and with very big audiences uh, and what I really learned from that was how little actually politicians put forward policies you know or develop policies you know we developed a whole range of policies that uh, you know, we thought out in terms of policing, in terms of housing, in terms of the environment, in terms of transport and whatever, um, and put them out and got some publicity for some of those ideas and, and, and they went down really well with people. But, but most of my opponents had not really kind of thought through why they wanted to be mayor. And we were the other way around. We wanted to enact the policies and, and, and be mayor for the policies, whereas they wanted to be mayor and maybe do something. Like that. Um, and I thought that was, that was very instructive. In terms of the, the Richmond by-election, uh, I thought, as I said in my talk today, that the great loss today is that we don't have proper local newspapers covering those sorts of issues, covering local campaigns, covering local scandals at the council or covering you know factories that are spewing out 
and uh, you know pollutants or or whatever. There, there just is not that local politics uh, issues in uh, the newspapers uh, as there was even as recently as ten years ago, and that's a fantastic loss. I think it's a real loss to our democracy that we don't have that sort of accountability anymore. Do you regard your run as a success? Because obviously you, you didn't get the nomination in the end, but you, this is for mayor. Um, as we see, Sidney Khan has recently uh, pledged to pedestrianise Oxford Street. What else, I mean, firstly, do you regard it as a success? And secondly, what other of your transport policies would you like to see Sidney Khan adopting? Well, uh, yes, yeah, surprisingly, I, it was a fantastic success because, because at the first hustings, uh, you know, Sadiq uh, heard my, my presentation, two minute presentation, and he said, oh, pedestrianise over Oxford Street, that's a great idea, I'll, I'll, uh, I'd like to do that. And, and from then on, he always mentioned it in all the subsequent hostels, there were about a dozen after all, and, and he always mentioned it. Did that and, all you and, have that No, yeah. actually not. No, I, I was very glad, I, I was very proud that people nicked my, my transport <laughs> policy. I mean, Tessa Jowell nicked my idea of of uh, a, a bus hop affair, which which uh, uh, I'd actually nicked off the Lib Dems, but I was really bringing <laughs> it forward, and uh, and she immediately kind of adopted that as a kind of big transport policy, and I was delighted that they did that. In fact, Sadiq has brought in the bus hop affair already, you know, which was mm. uh, being able to use more than one bus kind of on the on the same ticket uh, if you do it within the hour, and uh, uh, I also was very strong on cycling, and, and Sadiq. Although that, I, I, I think he was slightly hesitant at first, has kind of said he, he's going to spend a lot of money on, on cycling, has appointed a cycling walking commissioner. You know, I, think, I think by and large he is, he is uh, following uh, that agenda. And, and I think what I did was bring in a whole lot of environmental issues that I don't think the Labour Party had sufficiently kind of uh, thought about. So, so this green-red agenda that I pushed forward was... was uh, uh, was, was kind of adopted and so no I'm very proud of the campaign I, and, and, and the other aspect of it I'm very proud about was the fact that I did manage to attract a lot of young people into the campaign who helped me all the way through uh, and we had a fantastic amount of fun and that, you know, we had rules about you know if you're not enjoying yourself don't come to the meeting we had rules that we never had a meeting that was more than two hours our meetings were always two hours you know uh, uh, and it was the pub afterwards, and, and you know, and we and we had a fantastic designer, a, a designer of amazing uh, quality, uh, Dan Cooper, who, who who just gave us a real image. And so, so their website is still up. So, so the whole thing was, you know, we, we, we the best thing we did was to present a visualization of what Oxford Street would be. It cost me a thousand quid, but it, it was a visualization of what Oxford Street would look like pedestrianized, and that has been used. Everywhere, I, 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 I let go of the copyright. Of it. The Evening Standard, whenever they they, they have a thing about Pedestal, I use my image, right? And so that that kind of really helped change change things. So, no, in, in, in lots of respects, it was a success. And I got five thousand votes. I which I got five point six percent, which uh, more than one of the MPs. Is, uh, we have more than uh, well, one of the MPs got a thousand. Yeah. So so uh, a lot more than one of the MPs, and, and within touching distance of, of David Lamby, who'd, who'd spent like, far more money than I had on it and, and been at it kind of uh, uh, just as long. And so so uh, you know the fact that I came from nowhere and and, and, and uh, you know had a respectable total was great fun. Just quickly on that as well. So Labour had quite intense uh, competition for their. Uh, Candidate, whereas the Tories that goes with this, I mean, there were people opposing him, but that he was kind of shoehorned in. Do you think that was one of the reasons he lost, being quite complacent, or do you put that down to the divisive campaign? No, I think I think that actually that private process was very good for Labour. Yeah. Uh, um, just that actually it had been very good for Hillary uh, and Obama first time up for Obama. It was actually good for him that that you know that there was that strong contest. Um, oh, and, really Trump as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, it probably was good for Trump yeah. that, that ten people were against him and, and he, he pushed through and there was a lot of coverage of it and, and so on. Um, it didn't work so well for, for, for Hillary and, and Bernie Sanders, but, but then nobody quite expected Bernie Sanders to, to get as far as he did. So, so I think the idea of having uh, primaries is, is a strong one and, and uh, I think it stimulated a lot of interest. And, and yes, and Zach Goldsmith had virtually no, nobody competing against him seriously. Um, and, and he thought he would waltz into to the mayor, uh, just as he thought he would waltz into staying in, in Richmond. So, uh, in a way, I've been slightly involved in beating Zach twice, which is <laughs> um, You mentioned during the talk that a lot of people these days vote along EU lines rather than traditional party lines. 
Where do you think Labour's electoral future is in that regard? Because many of, sort of Labour's traditional working class voters perhaps voted to leave, whereas its sort of liberal elite voters voted to remain. Look, politics is partly about leadership, right? Or it's a lot about leadership. You can't just say, oh, lots of our people voted leave. In fact, actually, two thirds voted remain, right? Uh, you can't just say, oh, lots of them voted leave, so we have to sit on the fence or equivocate about this. You have to say, I believe in the EU. I believe in the EU not just as a, as a, free, a, a, a mark, free market area and a customs union or whatever. I believe in it kind of culturally uh, and, 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 and as a European and, and, and in terms of defence. You know, I am a European. I believe that we ought to have stronger ties with Europe than, than with uh, the US. I believe that our defences uh, should be tied in with those of uh, uh, Europe and, and not uh, uh, necessarily those of of, uh, uh, of America. And, and so, for all those reasons, we ought to be singing the praises of, of Europe and saying we are, you know, we are Europeans. We are all Europeans. Um, and I think we we missed out on that. And, and so, when when you're arguing with people. I think, and, and debating with them, I think you have to say that there are greater reasons why we should be part of Europe. And the fact that Europe has been, with the exception of Yugoslavia and, and Ukraine, uh, being at peace for 70 years uh, is really important and, and is partly down to the EU. And if it breaks up, you know, it, it might break up into all sorts of uh, potential conflicts. So, so that's that's why we have you have to lead. You just have to say we believe in Remain. It was the right thing to do, and and I can't understand these MPs uh, like Margaret Beckett, who said this is the most catastrophic thing that's happened in my life, but I'm voting for it. You know, <laughs> so I'm voting for catastrophe. That's not my position. I would, you know, I will fight against uh, leaving the EU right until the, it's signed on the dotted line, and then I'll probably campaign to rejoin it. What do you think about Corbyn's three line whip then? I think Corbyn's three line was a fantastic mistake. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, most of his MPs don't believe in it, so he's asking people to vote against their conscience. While he, you know, voted against the Labour whip for his conscience, kind of more than five hundred times, <laughs> and then he's asking people to vote against their conscience. I, I don't, I don't see that he has a credible position on that. Go back to Richmond quickly. Uh, one of the things you were heavily criticised for, and you said trolled. Uh, about was your uh, you didn't really consider or you didn't adopt a progressive alliance, um, whereas the Greens stood aside. And although there was a bit of controversy there, what were your thoughts about um, possibly if you'd let Zach in, would you have felt any guilt? Uh, no, I, if, if Zach had won by uh, 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 less than the, my vote, I, I, which I was, was I was dreading, but I would <laughs> not have. I would not have. Uh, felt guilty about it because I would have argued and, and uh, with some force that the people who still voted for me would have voted for Labour in full knowledge that uh, this might happen and that uh, they would not have voted for Lib Dems over uh, their dead bodies and that's the case with a lot of people that some people just won't vote Lib Dems. They remember uh, the Lib Dems being in coalition uh, with the Tories, they remember the Lib Dems uh, uh, pushing through all sorts of uh, uh, policies that uh, the Lib Dems themselves disagreed with, uh, and let alone Labour disagree with, um, and they won't vote uh, Lib Dem. So, uh, you know, if that had happened, I'd have said it's bad luck, it's terrible, but I don't think I stopped, uh, uh, you know, Sarah Olney from winning. As it happens, you know, I got a result that, I mean, we got a result that I was relatively pleased with, and, uh, you know, despite the fact that my vote was, was, was very low, but I understand why it was. Again, you touched upon this in your talk, but do you think a progressive alliance can actually work? Um, I think that it's very difficult. I, uh, uh, and I think, uh, funny enough, I, I, I had you know, vaguely supported the idea of a progressive alliance before going into it uh, more deeply and finding that the, the problems are more and more intractable about who exactly stands down where in favour of whom and what policies they adopt. So, you know, the, the example I gave in the talk, which is, is Copeland, which I think is very, you know, it's almost impossible to think of a, of a progressive alliance there because, you know, Labour equivocates on nuclear, which is a big issue there, um, uh, but the candidate is clearly in favour of, of nuclear, as she, as, as she has said. 
Um, uh, the, the Greens are absolutely dead against it. The Lib Dems are for it. Um, and so how, how do you then, who stands down in whose favour? So there might be some seats where these issues don't come up, but yeah. oddly enough, they seem to come up in, in most seats in one way or another, uh, making it very difficult to, to, to um, work out how it could be done. I think the only way it could be done is that you had a national policy where you looked at potential seats, and then you got the local, the local parties, uh, the, the local politicians of those parties, uh, together and said, right, we're thinking of, you know, uh, saying, you, you lot stand out there and you lot stand out there, what do you think of that? And you nego It will take a very long process of, of negotiation. I would like to see it uh, in some places, but it is much more difficult than I th even than I thought it was at the beginning. Can you have a, a progressive coalition, do you think, after an election? Would that work? I, I think... The, the Lib Dems have blown it in that respect, and I think probably you know Labour wouldn't uh, would would uh, worry about going in with the Lib Dems after what happened. But you know it depends on the numbers, doesn't it? Uh, you know if the numbers have been slightly different in 2010, uh, we might have ended up with a Lib Dem uh, coalition. You know probably needed ten more seats to to, to be with them uh, rather than with the Tories, uh, and so it might have been it might have been very different. Yeah. Uh, so. You know, nothing could be ruled out after an election. I, I think what the key idea of the Progressive Alliance is, is to uh, get this mixed government, this coalition government into power, which would then enact uh, electoral change so that you'd have a system of which would then be proportional representation. I think that's the core idea, but we're a long way from achieving that. Just a couple of things. How do you think Labour are going to do in this in these upcoming by-elections, Copeland and Stoke? Um, I mean, I, I think we're pretty doomed in Copeland, um, and so that's what I understand from people. I think Stoke Stoke will be close, uh, but uh, I think there might be some tactical voting in our favour, but there'll also be some tactical voting by Tories mm. uh, wanting to get rid of Labour um, and voting for Paul Nuttall. Uh, Although, you know, hopefully there aren't that many of them, but my, if I had to put a fiver on it, I might put a fiver on, on, uh, on uh, Paul Nuttall to win. Okay. Um, in terms of the future of Jeremy Corbyn, do you see him being leader in 2020? I don't think Jeremy Corbyn will be leader by, by 2020. Uh, I think that uh, unless the election results uh, prove otherwise and, and to go against the polls and, and uh, are all very positive for him, which I can't really see. I think we will win the mayoral elections uh, in 2017, mm -hmm. which will help him a bit, uh, but I think we might lose a lot of council seats and, um, uh, and, and we will do generally badly uh, and unless the polls start to pick up. Um, I don't actually think that he really ever expected to be leader um, and although I think he, you know, he enjoyed becoming leader and obviously stood again, it was very telling that in an interview with Jon Snow, uh, who had said, you know, do you want to be the next Prime Minister, he kind of resiled from saying that. It was quite curious that he did that. So I think the expectation was always that he might stand down in, in 18 or 19, and, and uh, uh, you know, he would hope that somebody from the left would, would take over. So like Clive Lewis, maybe. So possibly Clive Lewis or, or uh, some of the other people who have been mentioned, like Dan Jarvis or, uh, uh, or Keir Starmer, who are not necessarily on the left. But um, I can't really see a leader of the party into 2020 unless the polls change very quickly. And just finally, uh, do you have any funny slash amusing stories from your experiences in Richmond and in London? Because I know there was obviously that story about uh, the, the loo rule. There was, there was uh, uh, the first coverage of my, of my uh, campaign, which was the fact that I had once written a piece uh, quite relatively recently about the fact that I like these Japanese style toilets which don't use toilet roll and which use uh, a, a sort of shower spray uh, to clean yourself, which I think is actually the future and, and <laughs> they should be adopted everywhere. But clearly this got picked up by the press and so the first coverage I got was in the Daily Telegraph where you know, Labour candidates wants to ban new roll, which is I'd said at all, but nevertheless. Uh, and actually at the time I was a bit embarrassed about it, but later on I thought, uh, given that 
our campaign suffered from a slight lack of coverage. I thought, well, at least there was coverage. Uh, and there's nothing worse than, than uh, there's the, we'll, we'll think that the worse than bad coverage is no coverage. So at the end of the day, we laughed about it and kind of moved on. And actually, the idea is perfectly valid. It's just that, you know, British newspapers don't seem to be able to kind of talk about bums without laughing. <laughs> Christian Walmart, thank you very much for joining Pleasure. us. Pleasure. Thank you very much.